Okay, let's, uh, let's get going as the uh, final people get wedged into place in this slightly differently organized room. So, uh, welcome to the Institute for Government's event. If not for, to the Institute for Government, very many apologies for this uh, last minute change of location, but uh, amazing job by our events team in uh, realizing at 10 o'clock this morning that we weren't going to get water back in IFG and therefore we could neither provide food there nor give you necessary facilities. So, and very many thanks to the Royal Academy for Engineering for being so flexible to accommodate us and this quite large group at such short notice. So apologies if it's a slightly different organization from what you expected, but anyway. Um, one of the things that, as you know, we do at IFG is we are very interested in different ways in which uh, policy is made, better decisions can be made. And so when David Halpern, our former research director, now head of the Behavioral Insights team, told us that Professor Max Bazerman was over from the US and suggested that we ought to have a session with him uh, to talk partly about his most recent book, The Power of Noticing, but more generally about uh, all the work he's done on decision taking, uh, we leapt at the opportunity. So that was why we've had this event. So it's an absolute delight to welcome Professor Bazeman here to us today. Um, he's the Jesse Isidore Strauss Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School and co-director of the Center for Public Leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School. Now he's got, as you would expect, a huge range of research publications. His main research focuses on decision making, negotiation and ethics. So he's written lots of things. If you want to know what he's written, you can look that up. He's also, though, and I think this is in many ways very typical of people who work in academia in the US rather than in the UK, uh, also worked with almost every corporation you could possibly think of, um, but also worked across 30 different countries. So he's got a wide breadth of experience of sectors, uh, of different people and things. So what's going to happen now is that Professor Baseman is going to talk for uh, around 30, 35 minutes. We're then going to have another half hour for questions. We can run it a bit longer uh, if, uh, if there's lots of appetite and interest. But if not, then Max is going to stay behind outside, have a chat to some of you before we then whisk him across to IFG for something at 2 o'clock. If you want to live tweet, um, we will be tweeting, I think, from, from at IFG events. The hashtag is hashtag better policy. And without further ado, I'm delighted to hand over to Max Bazerman. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> and Jill, thank you and the team at uh, the Institute for Government for, for making this, this uh, event occur. Um, so I want to uh, talk about the area of decision-making broadly, um, uh, the topic of noticing, which I'll describe in some detail as a, spe uh, as a specific topic that I think that we need more work um, on, particular, particularly in the public sector. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk about how noticing connects uh, to the behavioral insights work um, that uh, is so visible in, in the UK um, and is really the reason that uh, I'm in town. So I'm in town, there's uh, about 30, 35 um, Harvard graduate students among you, um, and we're here working on a set of projects with the Behavioral Insight team. But um, more on that a little bit later. Um, so first of all, um, in, in the UK, um, one visible manifestation of the world of uh, uh, the study of decision making is, uh, is the work of Danny Kahneman's uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, which has sold over a million copies in the UK alone, which is really kind of quite phenomenal. Um, Kahneman won the Nobel Prize um, in 2002 um, in economics, which is very impressive for somebody who's not an economist. Um, he's a psychologist who really has revolutionized how we think about um, how humans make decisions in his work um, with Amos Tversky. Um, and perhaps the most famous problem that, that, that's been created in the area of decision making or perhaps in all of psychology um, in the last half century is the Asian disease problem, which talks about um, uh, a, a situation where you have the opportunity, where, where you're facing a threat uh, of a disease that's going to kill 600 people. Um, and you have two options to combat the, the disease. You can take program A, which will save 200 people, or you can take program B that has a one-third chance of saving all 600. 
Um, and when people have to pick uh, between these two, um, a significant majority go for A over B, um, largely because people tend to be risk averse in the domain of gains. The amazing part of this problem is that when you reword the two options in terms of losses, so 400 will die, or there's a two-thirds two chance that, um, that all 600 will die, um, people become risk-seeking so that they pick D over C, despite having picked A over B, and A and C are the same, and B and D are the same. And what's relevant here is not a minor shift in risk preference, but the fact that there's something that is non-rational about what humans do that really launched a whole area of inquiry into the systematic and predictable ways in which humans deviate from rational thought. And so much of political analysis, economic analysis, assumes rationality. And it's not just that we're, that we're off of rationality, that there's an error term on rationality, but there are a variety of systematic and predictable ways in which we can anticipate humans will deviate from rational thought. And here's just kind of a laundry list of some of my favorites, and the list goes on and on. And this is really a field that um, has identified what are these systematic barriers. I'm going to spend most of this talk talking about something that, that, um, that's, uh, that, I'm, uh, that I've been obsessed about um, since 2003, and I'll, 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 in this talk, date you to, um, to the event that, that, that made me obsessed with this topic. Um, but the, the, the topic is sort of our failure to notice, and I want to um, first introduce you to what I consider one of my massive failures to notice, um, and then, I'll, I'll, uh, and then I'll, I'll sort of leave you hanging and come back to, to the story a little bit later on in the talk. But, but I'll highlight before I start the story by saying um, uh, a lot of people, when I don't notice things, people make fun of me because I don't notice and I wrote a book on noticing, which I, I understand the humor. Um, <laughs> but the book makes it perfectly clear that I study noticing because I'm obsessed with the fact that I'm such a bad noticer in life. Um, so I know lots of people who kind of regularly point out what I notice. Um, so I, I simply plead guilty. This is going to be um, a, a story uh, about a noticing failure that I'm particularly obsessed by. So it has to do with a, um, a trial in the US. Uh, the US Department of Justice sued the tobacco industry. Um, and they sued the tobacco industry under something called RICO, which are racketeering laws. And uh, RICO laws were made to go after the mafia. And RICO laws have a particularly high standard of proof, but they allow the US government to impose penalties that go far beyond typical civil litigation. And in this case, it was filed in 1999. Um, the entire tobacco industry was accused of fraud and fraud through a conspiracy across organizations, which is what's required for um, a RICO attempt. So this was filed in 1999. The trial starts September 2004. Um, certainly in 2004, I had little to no awareness of this trial. I'm certainly a kind of an anti-tobacco person um, by background, but, but that would just be personally rather than professionally. Um, in this case, um, these are the frauds that the tobacco company was accused of, and there's no, there's no commentary on any of this yet by me. This is just kind of facts. Um, and what you'll notice is um, they're accused of doing something bad, but what makes it fraudulent is while denying doing so. And then coordinating that effort across companies is what uh, creates the conspiracy and makes it viable for a RICO trial. All right. Um, so I was hired um, after um, a particular remedy was viewed as not allowable because it was uh, past looking rather than future looking. Um, and I was hired as an expert in corporate governance um, and the psychology of how executives would behave. Um, and my, my testimony, which was submitted in writing, can, um, basically suggested that the government should, uh, um, should potentially do some pretty harsh things in terms of um, taking over the governance of the tobacco industry. So I, I wasn't particularly popular in the tobacco industry. 
Um, I was only hired and became aware of the details of this case when I was hired on March 10th, um, 2005. I filed my expert report a very small number of days later. Um, when I was hired, I was told that um, for legal reasons, I had to work quickly. Um, I was deposed on April 10th. Um, and what depose means is that you show up in advance of uh, trial and the other side gets seven, uh, in this case, seven hours to ask me any question they want so that they could um, learn what they wanted to learn about what I might say at trial. Mid-April, I submitted my direct testimony. That is the uh, question answer from the uh, Department of Justice asking me questions. Um, and I was scheduled for to testify in court on May 4th where the tobacco industry could cross-examine me. What I really want to focus on is um, April 30th. Okay? And eventually I spent 214 hours um, working at US taxpayer expense on this case. Um, by April 30th, I had spent 166 hours working on this case. And um, I showed up in Washington, DC to prepare with the Department of Justice attorneys who had been working with me so that they could prepare me for what I was going to face on May 4th. And as I um, showed up in this room at the Department of Justice, having submitted my direct testimony, getting ready for being cross-examined, I showed up and the attorney that I had been working with sits down across from me. Now, he was a very polite, person, and when I met him on March 10th, he did call me Professor Bazerman, and it took me about a week to get him to switch to Max, which is a name I prefer. Um, and, but he had clearly been calling me Max for over a month. And he sat down across from me and he said, Professor Bazerman, before we start, the Department of Justice requests that you amend your testimony to note that it would not be relevant if any of the following four conditions existed. And then he read to me a bunch of legalese um, describing the four conditions. And when he was done, he said, do you agree to amend your testimony? And I said, you know me well enough to know that I didn't understand what you just said. And that if I did understand, I'd probably say no. So why would I possibly say yes to your question? And he said, because if you don't, there's a good chance my superiors will remove you from the case before you testify on Wednesday. And I was roughly as confused as you are right now. Okay. And I said, okay, I don't amend my testimony. And he smiled and said, good, let's prepare in case you're still in the case. Okay. So I sort of had this kind of befuddlement of what's going on. Um, and I would in my defense, when, I, when, we, when it becomes clear um, what, I, what, I, what I do wrong in this story, um, in my defense, I, I was never so overwhelmed as I was at that particular period in time. So my mom was dying of cancer, my sister had lung cancer, I had already overcommitted to too many things, um, some of which I'll, I'll get back to. All right, so um, what followed was I ended up being quite busy for the week or so that followed partially due to tactics of the tobacco industry to keep me busy, which I think is intriguing. All right. Now, um, can you see that from back there? This, can, you, can you see a bad image, or do we need to lower the lights? You okay? I'm going to assume you're okay. I'm getting a mixed answer. All right. Now, um, um, it, it's a little blurry, but if, if, if it's possible to kill this first row of lights... That would be good. If not, no big deal. <laughs> Excellent. Perfect. Okay. No, no, turn that off. Exactly. Okay. Just, just until we're done, we move to the next slide. All right. So um, um, I'll come back to the tobacco story. But first, I want to show you a task. Some of you have seen this before. Um, so I'm going to do it relatively quickly. Um, uh, this is a video I saw in 2003. I was in the audience, um, and my colleague uh, presented this movie. Um, uh, this movie, by the way, I consider to be the greatest film ever made. Um, if you don't agree, it's not really a problem. It only lasts 18 seconds. 
Um, and, and in fact, it's not really one movie, it's two movies, and I'm going to show them to you at the same time. Okay? One of the movies has three players in white t-shirts passing a basketball to each other. The other movie has three players in dark, dark t-shirts passing a different basketball to each other. Your job is to ignore the players in the dark t-shirts and simply count the passes among the players in the white t-shirts. Okay, now the video ended with a pass in the air, including the pass in the air. The correct answer was 11. So congratulations to some of you. You did worse than most groups I work with. All right. Okay. And what's of more relevance is how many of you saw the clearly visible woman with an umbrella who walked across the screen? Okay. Looks like about 15% which is pretty good. Um, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I'll just play it again. Um, and I'll highlight that Ulrich Neisser made this movie in the 1970s. He's a Cornell uh, professor. Um, perhaps you see her now. Um, she's quite clearly available, uh, visible. And um, he talked about a term inattentional blindness, where he was talking about a visual inability to notice information when your mind is focused on another task. So the, the simple reason that many of you did not see the woman with an umbrella um, is that you were busy. You were busy doing what I asked you to do, counting the passes. Now, there, um, uh, so Ulrich Neisser um, uh, had a student by the name of Dan Simons. Um, Dan Simons uh, made a much more contemporary version of this. Some of you may have seen it. Um, it's called the Gorilla Video. Um, and it looks a lot like this, only instead of a woman with an umbrella, it has better visual clarity, and a woman dressed in a grill outfit walks across, thumps her chest in the middle, and then keeps on going. And the gorilla video gets more like a 35% um, observation rate. Um, I, the, uh, yeah, we can bring the lights back, thanks. Um, and um, what's fascinating about, uh, first of all, I use this version because too many people have seen the gorilla video. It became much more popular. Um, but my favorite participants are people who have seen the gorilla video. So when I pop this up, they try to count passes and look for the gorilla. Okay. And I generally find that people looking for gorillas can't count the passes because their mind's too busy. Um, and they tend to not see the woman with the umbrella either. Okay. Um, I was in the audience in 2003 when my colleague, Professor Mazreen Banaji, showed this at a talk at Harvard. Um, I'm proud to tell you um, that I correctly counted the passes as 11. Um, I'm good at focusing. Okay? And then she played the video again, and that started my 12-year obsession with the topic of noticing, because um, I, I had not seen the woman with the umbrella, and I was stunned by my failure. Now, some of you are thinking, I did what you told me to do. What's your point? I have no good answer to that question at all. Um, I find it fascinating that we can miss su such clearly visible information. And what I would emphasize is that so many of the important things that public servants need to notice are things that no one tells us it's our job to notice. And I'll, 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 I think I'll provide you with some examples of that as we move forward. But first, before we get to public service, um, uh, um, sorry about the black print, I, I, I'll, I'll make it clear. This is a, this, these are um, cum cumulative returns to investments over a nine-year uh, period. Um, this goes from minus 60, minus 40, minus 20, 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. This is the return for the S&P 500. Sorry for the uh, American tilt of this chart. Okay, so this blue line is the S&P 500. Um, your job is to decide as an investment advisor um, which of the other four funds you're going to recommend to a client. You're not going to recommend the S&P 500. That's boring, and they don't need you to invest in the S&P 500. So you're either going to boldly pick the tobacco fund, despite my earlier slides, which is the green, the alpha fund, which is the orange, 
the fortitude, which is the purple, or the power trade, which is the yellow. And it's now your job to pick between, again, tobacco trade, alpha in orange, fortitude in purple, power trade in yellow. Okay. Now, with what you have in front of you, how many of you are going boldly to the tobacco trade fund? There's always, there's typically a few, no one today. Okay, alpha. Fortitude. Power trade. Okay. So vast majority for fortitude. What's wrong with fortitude? That's good, isn't that? It's unlikely. Moderate term, medium risk. <laughs> Market timers are notoriously not effective. All right. So what's wrong with what most of you did is you invested in Madoff. OK. And if instead of asking you, what investment would you pick if the question had been, is it possible to, consist to consistently outperform the market with absolutely no volatility? People who have had a couple of economics classes know that the answer to that question is no. Okay, if you had a finance class, that makes it even easier. Okay? What I'm arguing, and, and by the way, I gave you like 25 seconds. Okay, and some of you would claim I never even had an economics class. But what I'm arguing is that Madoff's returns weren't theoretically possible, and yet there are lots of people with MBAs and PhDs from appropriate fields um, who were working with hedge, in hedge funds who were feeding money into, of their clients into Madoff um, and not noticing that these returns were not conceivable um, to be real. Okay. Now, this raises the question, did they not notice or did they not act? Okay. So the, and we clearly know that there were people who um, did not notice. So the, the hedge fund manager who, uh, uh, from French nobility who shot himself two days after Madoff was arrested, um, he had invested all of his money, all of his family's money. I think he didn't notice. Okay. I, I think it's quite conceivable that there were hedge funds uh, who had a pretty good idea, but they were making good money. They noticed, but they didn't act for selfish reasons. But what I want to suggest is that the, I think that the majority of people who didn't notice okay, were people who had a sense that something is peculiar, but they were making good money on the current system, and they simply didn't look into it. They didn't pay attention to a hint um, and pursue that to find out what was wrong with, it, with this issue. So um, people always want to know, did they not notice or not act? And what I find when I look at failures to, to notice or failures to act is that the most common story is that people are in the, in the middle. They had some hint, they had some awareness, but they didn't pursue the data to have a clear enough answer. Here are just some factoids. Um, the U.S. government knew that terrorists were willing to become martyrs for their cause and that their hatred toward the United States was increasing. Terrorists had previously bombed the World Trade Center. Terrorists hijacked an Air France airplane and made an aborted attempt to turn it into a missile aimed at the Eiffel Tower. Um, terrorists had also failed an attempt to simultaneously hijack 12 U.S. commercial airplanes in Asia on the same day. And airline passengers knew how simple it was to board an airplane with items such as small knives that could be turned into weapons. Okay. Um, I would argue that these bullet points suggest, suggest that we should have secured the cockpit doors of every plane long before 9-11 occurred. Okay? Um, what's, and, and there's good reason to believe that this information was organized well enough in the U.S. government to notice. I refer to the September 1996 draft of the Al Gore Aviation Security Commission report as evidence that this information was well enough organized, um, but we really failed to notice and to act 
on this information, and I argue that we should have. How could Arthur Anderson vouch for the financial health of Enron concealing billions of dollars in debt from its shareholders? And I would argue at the heart of this story is that we have people who we hire to make sure corporate books are reasonable and clean. They're called independent auditors. And then we've gone about destroying this function by allowing these firms to corrupt our laws and create a system where the one thing that independent auditors can't provide are independent audits. And the reason that they can't is the same as why you wouldn't believe the person next to you if you asked them, how smart is your child? And they told you, my child is brilliant. Okay? It's not that they're not an honest person, but psychologists have long known that when humans have a desire to see a data, data a particular way, they're incapable of independence. And when we allow an audit system to cr be created where auditors make tremendous profit from selling consulting services, where auditors want to please their clients to be rehired, and we allow auditors to take jobs with their client organization, um, what we've done is we've created the conditions where the one thing that independent auditors can't provide are, are independent audits, which really raises the question, why would we have this function if we're not going to implement it in a reasonable way? Okay, so um, back to my tobacco story and my failure. Um, so it's interesting where we're located for this talk. Um, I only kind of looked up sort of where the Institute for Government was located um, kind of last night before I went to sleep. Um, but on June 17th, um, I was working for a corporation in London located very close to where we are, we are. And I was sleeping that night in the Sofitel Hotel. Um, uh, which is about a three-minute walk from where we are. Um, and despite the fact that it's a perfectly nice hotel, um, I woke up at five in the morning wide, wide awake. So some, some version of jet lag. Um, and I opened up the New York Times. And on the front page of the newspaper was a story about a guy named Matthew Myers, who's the president of Tobacco Free Kids and one of the world's leading anti-tobacco -tobac advocates. Um, and what the story reported was Matthew Myers coming forward with the allegations that Robert McCollum, the number two official in the Department of Justice, had attempted to, to manipulate his testimony by asking him to amend it to note that it would not be relevant if four conditions existed. Okay? And um, the more I read, the more I was reading a deja vu of the experience that I had been through on April 30th. And on the one hand, I was kind of shocked that this could occur on a repeated basis by the US Department of Justice. But my overwhelming sense was that I really screwed up. That on April 30th, with the data that I gave to you, I should have done something, okay? And I can come up with lots of, lots of defenses about why I did nothing. Okay. I was overwhelmed. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know who to call, et cetera, et cetera. Except that I didn't know who to call um, was kind of undermined. Because what I did at 5 a.m. was I called Marla. I'm married to Marla. And she was in Boston. She knew more about Washington than I did at, at that point in time. I woke her up. It was midnight in Boston. I said, um, um, go wake up. I'm calling you back in five minutes. I have something important. I told her what I now knew. I said, I think I'm supposed to do something. Okay? But meanwhile, Washington was sleeping, and Marla was sleeping. And so I said, and I'm going to be gone with a day of commitments. When I get out of work around 5, I'll call you. So I went off and did my corporate thing in London. And at 5 PM, I called Marla now noon in Boston and Washington, D.C. And I said, OK, what's up? And she said, OK, there's a group in Washington called the Government Accountability Project. They represent whistleblowers. That seems to be what you are. Um, you're supposed to call Louis Clark. Um, he's waiting for your call now. Um, after you talk to him, there's a reporter from the Washington Post. She'll be your second call. Call her, and she'll cover the story. All right. Now, what's a little bit, so, so let's assume Washington woke up at 8.30 rather than at 9. Marla only had three or three and a half hours 
and I had no problem figuring out what I needed to do, given the situation that, were, that I was in. But back on April 30th, um, sort of I didn't do anything, okay? And with the information that Marla provided, if you Google uh, Bazerman tobacco, you can read kind of um, sort of all the, the details. But for, for, for me, it was a personal experience on sort of when something's off, go figure it out. The fact that it's ambiguous and you're confused about what it is um, um, should not be a reason to, to not act. So put noticing on your agenda, take an outsider's view. When we're in the middle of something, it's hard to figure out what to do. Um, it, 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 when you're a leader in government, audit your organization, identify what could be keeping other people from not acting. Um, but when something's wrong, figure it out rather than viewing the ambiguity as a reason to do nothing. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so I also want to talk about something that's a, a little bit, it's quite fascinating and uh, it's a little bit like bringing um, um, snow to the Eskimos or something like that. Um, uh, um, and, and that is sort of noticing in the world of using behavioral insights. So many of you know Thaler and Sunstein's book, Nudge. Um, uh, all of you know about David Halpern and the behavioral insights team. Um, uh, um, and, and the behavioral insights team, for those of you who aren't aware, um, are like um, way, way, way ahead of the, uh, the dozen other emerging behavioral insight teams throughout the rest of the world. Um, the UK has a what, what, What's work, Works project, but we are seeing more and more demonstrations throughout the world. And what I want to highlight is that these demonstrations occur because people notice that something's wrong with the way government's working. And then they identify what would be better, and then they identify what would a convincing test look like. And I think that what I would hope that public servants throughout the world would do is view it as their job to notice what's wrong, and rather than say, that's the way government works, or that's the way the world works, to identify what it is that we can do differently. So Johnson and Goldstein are the folks who noticed that the organ donation rates are dramatically different across these 11 European um, countries. Um, this is in 2003. Sorry, you did really poorly here. Um, the US is on the left-hand side. And the critical difference is these four countries are opt-in. In order to be part of the organ donation system, you have to sign something saying, take my organs if they'd be useful. The difference is that on the right-hand side, um, you're in the system unless you sign a card saying, please don't take my organs. So same choice to citizens in both countries, but the default matters tremendously. And defaults are enormously powerful um, without taking away people's liberty. Everybody wants to know what's wrong with Sweden, um, which is really harsh given if we compare Sweden to the UK, it's, uh, they're, they're massively successful. But the answer to what's wrong with Sweden is Sweden gives families the right to override um, um, after the death happens. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip over gender, but afterwards I'm happy to talk about uh, gender nudges, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna pass over that um, and talk about promises. Um, um, and promises in official capacity occur in two ways. Um, in the US, before um, we provide testimony in a court of law, we raise our hand and say, uh, the testimony I'm about to pro provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, okay? Um, it's oral, but I want you to uh, more focus on the fact that it's before. Um, and more commonly, people fill out forms and then they sign, what I told you is the truth, okay? And what my colleagues want, uh, um, argue, and we think we have pretty good data on, is um, that timing matters. And if you wanted people to tell you the truth, does it make sense to have them fill out something and say, I told you the truth, or does it make more sense to have them sign a form saying, I'm about to tell you the truth, okay? If your intuition is signing first is better, okay, first you're right, okay, and second I want you to notice that your government agency's been getting it wrong for decades, 
okay, that in fact we can improve honesty by having people sign first. So our initial evidence for this comes from a laboratory task where we pay people to solve puzzles, and these puzzles are very simple. You find the two numbers that add up to 10, and you circle them, okay? And our subjects, after they earn income, they then fill out a form to tell us how much money we owe them, okay? And I'm going to simplify this um, and tell you that if the form looks like a standard tax form where you fill it out and then you sign it, okay, people cheat. Not a lot. They actually cheat a little bit, okay? If you have them sign first, I'm about to tell you the truth, they cheat, but by about half as much. So we can reduce about 50% of the cheating in a context where there's no verifiability at all by simply moving the signature from the bottom to the top. And then we replicate this with an insurance company who wants to know what does your odometer, uh, what does your odometer say because we're gonna charge you for your car insurance based on how much you drive. It turns out people lie about that so that they can pay a lower premium. When you move the signature from the bottom to the top, you, you reduce the cheating quite dramatically. And the BIC unit now has trials going on in the tax world, okay, both in the UK and Guatemala. Um, I'm optimistic, but we're waiting to see the results. Um, up here um, are a bunch of results. The print may be too small to see, but you can come and see which one you like best. So this is my last slide, and I'll leave, leave it up here. Um, but um, I'm a professor at Harvard uh, um, with uh, my colleague, Iris Bonnet. Um, who, uh, all those gender slides that I skipped over, I stole those from her, so I, I can, t uh, but I'm happy to tell you about those. But Iris and I um, are co-directors of something called the Behavioral Insight Group. Um, clearly, we're trying to benefit from the success of the Behavioral Insight Team. We're a group rather than a team. Um, and what the Behavioral Insight Group is, is a collection of 28 professors from across Harvard uni uh, University's many colleges. Um, all of, all of whom do field experiments for the public good. So we're interested in, in, in doing the academic side of what the Behavioral Insight Team is up to. We're partners with the Behavioral Insight Team um, on both creating conferences to convene um, the world leaders on the topic um, and also to train the next generation of nudgers or Behavioral Insight Team members from countries around the globe. Um, my colleagues, uh, at Harvard do lots of nifty studies across lots of different topics. Um, uh, with me in the audience, my, my colleague, Professor Mike Luca is here, um, and uh, one, of the, uh, one of the most amazing nudges around is uh, Mike Luca kind of um, raised the question, why do, people, why do cities randomly inspect restaurants? And when I said to him, what do you mean, why do they randomly inspect restaurants to keep them clean? He said, no, the question is randomly, if you just go into Yelp, customers have already told you where all the dirty restaurants are, okay? That's kind of a high-tech behavioral insight. Um, and um, I'm surrounded at Harvard by academics who are, who are interested in finding real-world solutions to fascinating problems that are confronting government. Um, so if you have nifty problems and the BIC unit isn't the right collaboration, or, um, or you want collabor collaborators be, um, from academia, um, you can let us know and we'll do our best to find the right collaborators for you. Um, and after we found, after we created this unit, this research unit of professors, um, uh, students started showing up in large numbers and said, what are you doing for us? And the simple answer is we didn't have a good answer to that. We, we were creating a research unit. Um, um, but we've created um, a variety of courses that respond to student demand. Um, our graduate students in the Kennedy School and the Business School and elsewhere are, are fascinated by the world of behavioral insight teams. Um, so 37 of us are traveling together to the UK and to the Netherlands working across 10 different projects um, and learning from the expertise that exists within the behavioral insight team. I think I'm probably over, I'll stop and let you
so we haven't got that much time. So That's I'm going to pitch. Uh, I'm going to pitch away and see if there are any questions in the audience. There should be some roving mics lurking around. There's carrot back. So let's come. So it's quite a long thing. As oh, Lauren popping up. So why don't we come? We'll do. Let's come to the front here. Yeah. And then we'll go there and there. Yeah. Yes. Tell us who you are. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Valerie Mocker and I work at Nesta. So I think one of the things that came out for me from your graphs of the stock market and, you know, the 9-11 events was that if you visualize something differently and you take the time to think about it, you could see certain patterns, right? But there are certainly different tools for seeing these patterns. So recently I talked to Jeff Hoffman, who is the founder of Pricen.com. What he does is that he takes 20 minutes every morning to browse through the news write it down and look at patterns. And one day he had the idea of Pricing.com, which became a billion dollar business. So what specific tools or tricks do you, do you have or would you recommend to, to start noticing? Yeah, so I, 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 so I, I realized I was um, um, uh, not getting through my slides and I mm. sped up at some point. You probably noticed that. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so there was a slide where I talked about sort of intervention strategies and, and um, so the, the last thing that I would do is assume that I know how to notice because of my history of failure. Um, so, uh, so it's, uh, and, and I think that the reason, uh, part of my excuse for being such a lousy noticer is that I'm so focused. Okay, sort of give me a task, give me a goal, boom, I'm off working on it. And I think that that's what many of you are guilty of, probably, maybe not as ex to the extreme that, that, that I'm guilty. And, and the question is, how can us focusers take the time to occasionally look around and say, are there big things that we should be paying attention to? Okay. Um, and so that 20 minutes came, may be that individual's way of doing it. Um, other people um, think that the key to being a better noticer is meditation in some form. I'm not a meditator. I'm not really an alternative kind of person. But I'm open to the fact that that may be a perfectly good strategy. Um, uh, I, um, I think that the idea of reflection is a good one. So, um, I, so last week, bef before getting on a plane Friday night to, to come here for, as part of this course, you're, you're part of our course, um, um, I taught a, a, a one-week intensive course last week on, on noticing. And, um, and there's a group project which requires a lot of work. Um, but there's a short assignment, and the short assignment is write a two-pager on basically how are you going to take the content from this course and become a first-class noticer, which is a term I borrowed from uh, somebody by the name of Warren Bennis, who was a terrific leadership writer. Um, and I think the, no, the idea of reflecting um, on that um, can be very useful. And I think reflection can take a variety of forms. Um, at the end of the day, what's the most important thing I've been working on today? What's the most important thing that I didn't work on today that I need to get to? Okay. Um, after 9-11 occurred, and I, did, I wrote a book in 2004 with Michael Watkins called Predictable Surprises, which is kind of an early, uh, early uh, treatment of, of, of the power of noticing. Um, and um, and uh, so I'm one of those people when you get on an airplane, um, I, I, I kind of categorize airplane people into two kinds. Those who mind their business, read the newspaper, eat and sleep, and those who want to talk to the person next to them. Okay, and I'm in the former category, but, but if, you're, if you're like me, um, you know that you run into people who sit next to you who want to talk. And um, after 9-11, and I had this early idea that 9-11 was preventable, um, I would start asking people, can you think of uh, an issue in your organization that is critically important, deserves attention, and your organization is ignoring it? And that question leads people, blah. I mean, I, I, you just get answers to that question. And, and, and the point of that is, if you stop and ask yourself, what are the key threats and challenges facing your organization? My guess is that you can come up with some answers to that question, okay? But you can also ask other smart people around you, okay? Because what I find is in all these disaster stories, and we can add more, we can add the Catholic Church, we can add the Penn State scandal, um, 
uh, just the whole slew of scandals that, that we've seen, there were always hints. There were always people who had some information and for a variety of reasons didn't act. So as a leader, how do you harness the fact that those hints are out there in order to act? And, 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 I, and for me, the most important action part, and, and I'm, I'm sort of insulting <coughs> myself with this one, is when something is off, that isn't reason to drop it because you don't, don't understand. It's reason to go figure uh, uh, stuff out. Um, uh, last week in the course, uh, um, there was a UNC um, uh, University of North Carolina cheating scandal that was connected to the, a to the athletic program. And there was a reporter by the name of Dan Kane, who was the leading journalist who covered the story. Um, and uh, we Skyped him in because we were doing a, a case, uh, we were covering that particular story. And one of the things that he said is, as a journalist, when um, something is off and he can't make sense out of something that shouldn't be all that complicated, for him, that's a hint that he may have a great story and to pursue it. And I think that most of us in leadership do just the opposite. When it doesn't make sense, we have enough stuff that we know how to solve. We spend our time on that, and we don't pursue the ambiguous, important issue. So I think your question is, is, the, is the toughest question. It's so much easier to document how people, have, people screwed up than it is to identify how to fix it. Um, at the risk of uh, self-promotion, the last chapter of, the, of my most recent book, The Power of Noticing, is, is my attempt to, to fully answer your question. So have you seen organization, because there's one thing about doing it at an individual level, and there's another thing about doing it at a sort of organizational level, if you think there's a sort of risk that you're not a noticing organization. We have all these uh, big literature here of policy failures for people sort of, you know, just yeah. going along, going with the flow and stuff like that. So have you seen organizations that have successfully adopted sort of tactics to make them more noticing? It's going to sound like I'm being ingratiating, but the best example I can come up with, uh, of, uh, up with up, the best example I can come up with is the Behavioral Insights team. I mean, so what, what do they do? They, they look for things that if people asked, are we doing it the right way? No, we're not doing it the right way. Why aren't we doing, this, uh, doing it the right way? Oh, we've always done it this way. It has a historic precedent. Um, and, and they notice these opportunities for low-cost interventions that can create big improvements. And I think that they've implemented the task of noticing better than any other organization <coughs> that I know of. Okay, that's a good write-up for the behavior insights team. Let's come along and take a little crop. Yeah, and then we'll go back. Hi, I'm Michael Warren from the Cabinet Office. Um, now, isn't this just a bit of a recipe for faffing around? Uh, I'm sorry, a little bit louder. Yeah. Isn't, isn't this just a recipe for faffing around? I mean, um, if an organization... I don't understand that word. Faffing, <laughs> faffing doesn't translate. P procrast so procrastination. Americans don't faff. Um, <laughs> wasting time um, instead of just getting stuff done. So... Oh. So... Um, <laughs> so... It, so, no, let me, I'll just expand for you. So, I mean, a lot of organizations, successful organizations, talk about the power of um, inculcating a set of values which all yeah. the employees buy into. The idea is that you get everyone to get a, an esprit de corps going, and, uh, and that makes you more productive because people are on the same path, right? So what you're describing suggests that there's a lot of a disruption needs to happen, people who sort of stand back and kind of question uh, and this obviously personally attracts me a lot because I'm one of those sorts of people. And I'm sure a lot of people in the room, because we're here, are those sorts of people. Uh, but those kind of people don't often get on well in organizations. So I'm wondering, from your perspective, what is the sort of the way that this can be implemented without being seen to be an impediment on to making productivity? productivity yeah. yeah, so, uh, um, so I, I think there were a few questions, uh, uh, all, all of which were terrific. So, so one... Um, you, you need an orientation toward using behavioral insights to make things better from the top. So you need to sort of have an endorsement. Um, so just to be clear, my politics are decidedly left. Um, and I think that, that David Cameron sort of being such a strong sponsor of, of using behavioral insights has been absolutely critical to what's happened in the UK. So I think uh, leadership paying attention makes a tremendous amount of difference. Um, in terms of procrastinating, 
um, um, in some cases. So um, I mentioned the example of my colleague in the back, Mike Luca, who has this observation, why randomly inspect when Yelp will already tell you where the dirty restaurants are? My reaction is, yeah, like he's right. Um, go do this. Like implement this sooner rather than later. Um, do more work with, um, with even fewer staff and, and target um, what you're paying attention to because the data is there and we've been ignoring this data. I, we, don't need any, we don't need any further testing. But there's so many things where we have pretty good ideas, but we don't know what the right implementation looks like. Um, so David Halpern, in, in one of his regular presentations, um, he, he has a slide with, um, with how to increase uh, uh, blood donation. I think it's blood donation. Uh, um, but, and then he has sort of eight different arms of the trial, okay? And, uh, and, um, and it's memorable for me because I, uh, um, I, I, I followed the pattern that I'm, that I'm going to describe. And sort of two of them look like the lead contenders, okay? And he unravels the donation rate cell by cell. And so, so it's, you know, F and G that I'm, that are my, no, let's make that uh, H and I, okay, the seventh and eighth. Um, that were my picks, and I think most people's picks. And he goes through the other six, and then he gets to H, and it's better than the first <laughs> six he presented. Like, yeah, I got it right. And then he moves to I, which was my other top two pick, and it's not good at all, okay? And, and I think, you know, one of the reasons why um, academics are such fans of running experiments and why the Behavioral Insight team is, is a fan of running an experiment. Um, if you're going to unravel a program that's going to affect 40 million people, why wouldn't you run a two-month trial on 20,000 that can basically refine your ideas and make it more effective? So the, uh, the idea of low-cost testing, um, I think, is so persuasive that once, once the UK government started moving in that direction, I think it's, um, it's gained a lot of traction. Um, I should also be clear, so I'm a business school professor. Um, I think that the idea of testing um, is even less accepted by corporations, okay? With, with um, the exception of kind of Silicon Valley high tech world, um, who are really doing a massively good job of using testing to be more effective, to be more profitable. Um, so I think that um, testing is underused in government, should be used even more widely, more broadly, um, but that's not an indictment of government in comparison to other sectors. Um, it's an indictment of government in comparison to what would optimally be the case. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, I think we've got two people in that. So do you want to... Um, James Kidner from the Foreign Office. Fascinating talk, and thank you very much. We must clearly go out and buy the book. But... I want to just come back to that point you made in, the answer, your, in your answer to the first question about, about having that sort of sniff that something isn't quite right. Yeah. And when I've talked around the world to people about the work of the Behavioral Insights team, quite often there's been that sort of sense that, that, that there's a continuum here with, with excellent policy outcomes at one side and manipulation at the other. Yeah. How do you keep the moral compass in this enterprise? Because if you want selectively to, clearly you want a particular outcome in whatever enterprise you're, you're, you're researching or, or, or affecting. And if you want that particular outcome, how do you stop yourself selecting that information that persuades, for example, those energy users in the second tier of, of your examples above to choose neighbors who use less energy and therefore everyone ends up losing less? Yeah. Um, so, uh, terrific question. Um, and, and, uh, the version I most co commonly hear, again, I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is about 85% Democrat. Um, and, and I'm a, a stereotypic Cambridge, Massachusetts resident. Um, and the version that, that commonly gets asked in Cambridge is, do you really want Dick Cheney picking your nudges? Um, and and, and that, 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 that question just annoys us, you know. So, um, and, um, and my, first of all, my answer to that question is no, I don't want Dick Cheney picking my nudges, so that makes me nervous. Um, but but I'm, I'm struck by the fact that um, the Cameron government, government, that I view as right-leaning, um, has been so effective and has focused on implementation and making government work better much more than policy. 
So w certainly one, one strategy is to focus on implementation rather than the selection of policy and nudges. So, um, so, um, so move, move it in that direction. Whether you're going to legislate it or not, I think we're moving into I need to understand the political environment before I could even cope with it. So my overall reaction is I, I think you have a valid theoretical concern, um, but for, as a practical matter, um, it, it doesn't appear to be an enormous problem. Okay, so um, I have been visited um, by um, representatives of a government who was um, who brought me a problem. Can you help us thinking think about how to make this nudge more effective? And it was in a domain that I didn't want to work on. Okay, I wouldn't call it. I would say I was politically uncomfortable with it. Um, so I think that those things exist, but the fact that they could exist shouldn't keep us from making, creating massive improvements in so many other domains. So, you know, uh, you know I, I think that eventually the British government will save hundreds of millions of pounds by moving the signature from the bottom to the top. Um, that's, that's hard to argue against how do we get people to pay the taxes that they owe? Or how do we get students to stay in school? Or how do I get people to get the right health care that, um, that they need? So, um, so you have a theoretical concern. Um, it doesn't rise to me to be a practical concern yet. And I could prove to be wrong, but I'm, I'm betting against that. The, the final thing that, that, that I'll comment on and, th and what I'm about to say is not universally agreed on, um, but, but in, in the U.S., where we had a left-leaning government for a while, um, and we clearly have made far less um, progress on uh, using behavioral insights within a government context the way the U.K. government has, um, one explanation for that um, is that when the left wing suggests a nudge, the right wing thinks it's regulation. And when the right wing suggests a nudge, the left wing thinks it's a good idea. Okay, so, um, so it raises questions about who can most effectively um, implement these kinds of ideas. But terrific question. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. If I understand you correctly, you're saying we should all be more curious about what goes on around us and in the world. Um, for many years, I was an, an accountant. Um, I'm sorry. And, and yes. Well, <laughs> yes and no. I can understand how you feel. And there were situations that all came across where things didn't look quite right. Yeah. And you think... You know, red lights were flashing all over the place. In some cases, you know, it turned out there was a real problem. Somebody had their hands in the till. But in other instances, there was actually a perfectly innocent, rational explanation sure. uh, about not every, you know, if red right lights are flashing all over the place, it doesn't necessarily mean that if something doesn't look right, then there is a big problem, and it's a matter of judgment in each individual case. What is actually, the question people should be asking is, what is actually going on here without getting paranoid? Okay. And uh, for example, uh, I remember before the banking crisis, there were people who told me, you know, you, you do realize there's a banking crisis coming. And there were a number of people who predicted all this. Uh, it didn't come straight of a, you know, there were signs all over the place. So, uh, so I, I, uh, four quick answers. First of all, on the banking crisis, Michael Lewis's book, The, the Big Short, um, is a phenomenal documentation of people who saw it coming. Unfortunately, they weren't working for government to solve the problem. They made money off a of betting short. Um, but, but no doubt that there, there were people um, who noticed. Um, uh, I also wanted to make, I, I do have an undergraduate degree in accounting, so, um, so I was part of the, the uh, loosely connected to that world. Um, so I think your comment about curiosity is right on target, um, that, that being curious is useful. Um, 
but I, I, I guess I want to add two things to it. Um, one, cur curiosity is a little bit um, ambiguous. And I think we can be much more precise and clear about where the hints are, and we can be much more clear to the, um, to the f woman who asked the first question, what can, we do about, what can we do about it when we sort of are curious? So I think that, we're, that we've advanced the state of knowledge about what it is that we can do um, when we have this hint. So, for, so what I'm arguing is my failure on April 30th, 2005, is that I thought something was wrong. I thought that this was a bizarre request. I think I was curious, but I was also busy, and I never figured out what to do or to act um, in response. And I think that, the, and the more and more I read, I, I, I find that what you're saying is correct, that in every, in every big episode, um, there were people who sort of noticed something, they didn't move on it. And uh, sort of your opening comment, I think you're entirely right. I mean, if you pursue everything that looks slightly off, sometimes there's gonna be a completely good reason for why people were doing what they were doing, and there is no scandal. My uh, guess is that's gonna be true most of the time. Um, but if we pursue a half a dozen different things and one thing allows us to keep a massive disaster from occurring, that's well worth our um, sort of pushing our curiosity. I was quite interested. If you look at the IMF evaluation of the financial crisis, mm -hmm. they actually say in that that even in the run-up, I mean, their chief economist right. was giving a paper at Jackson Hole saying there's a problem, was still signing off the World Economic Outlook saying everything's all right. And the IMF were telling the Germans, the Canadians, they were to make their banking uh, supervision more like touch, like the US and the UK, because it was such a success there. But I think it's a really interesting question about conflicts of interest. I mean, yeah. on the accounting thing, where you say actually the fact that Arthur Anderson were basically regarding the audit contract as a bit of a lost leader to sell in some consulting services gave them a bit of a conflict of interest. I mean, do you think that there's a policy issue there that? We've yes. sort of lost the, lost the sight of accounting. Yeah, so, so uh, it, it, but it's not just, so, so I'm not sure auditing was a loss leader. It, it was not as profitable as consulting. Consult, they, Arthur Anderson was making more money off, of, far more money off of the $27 million of consulting services than the $25 million of auditing services. Um, but conflict of interest is so often a reason why we, don't notice and why the government needs to intervene to create more um, logical, rational systems. So auditors um, wanted to sell consulting services, they wanted to get rehired and they took jobs with, with the firms that they audited, none of which makes any sense if you asked how would we create an independent auditing system. So, uh, so auditing, the, I think the, the, what governments should do is that auditors should only audit, they shouldn't be allowed to perform any other services. Um, they should be hired on fixed, non-renewable, non-fireable uh, contracts so that they have no incentive to please their client in order to keep the work. And I don't think that individuals who work on Company A's audit should be allowed to take a job with Company A for, for multiple years into the future. I don't think it's that complicated. Um, uh, we just haven't had the political will to get it done. And it's not just auditing. Uh, the security rating agencies, were, which were so much a part of the, of the housing scandal as well, look just like auditors in terms of selling other services, having a race to the bottom by pro having the lowest standards possible. Um, and, if, and if they could get a job with one of their clients, they wanted them. Okay, final question. Um, picking up on the thought, David Walker from Guardian Public, uh, picking up on your, just your mentioning of political will. You began talking to us by reference to big tobacco and its... Uh, the suit by the Department of Justice. You'll know on your side of the Atlantic, as here, governments have known about the pernicious, indeed the fatal effects of tobacco since the early 50s. Give right. us some sense of where, in the wider scheme of ideology, interest, political structure, this uh, behavioral insights thing fits. Honestly, are we really talking about a niche? Certain smaller kinds of policy might be susceptible to this technique but the broad gauge politics and public management resulting from political decisions will continue on the basis, another example you gave, uh, airline security. There are good material capitalist reasons why airlines didn't pursue 
the remedy that was proffered in the 1990s in terms of security. Those interests are not going to go away, however much rationality may lie behind the prospect of behavioralism. There are lots of questions um, on that one. So, so just, just briefly on tobacco, um, um, I, I think it's uh, clear that the tobacco industry engaged in a misinformation campaign amazingly successfully from the early 50s, or you can even date it to 1929, um, until the 1980s. Um, and I think an uh, enormous part of their success was the people were only killing themselves or people thought. Um, a critical turning point in the tobacco story um, was um, what's called the um, Japanese wives study. And that sounds sexist, but it was about Japanese wives. Um, and the study looked at um, uh, Japanese women who were in, in the house most of the day um, and looked at the health risks associated with being married to a, a man who smoked versus a man who did not smoke. And the results were um, amazingly strong. And that meant that secondhand smoke was relevant. And that really moved it from an individual rights issue to what are you doing to the broader society. And, and so, th so that was a critical turning point um, to get politicians um, to act in the U.S. So, the, so, so while I completely agree with you, we knew the data by 52, um, I don't think that the public understanding of it um, changed until the 1980s, unfortunately. Um, it, it, um, so I, I, through most of my career, I've taught um, negotiations as the, the core topic. And, um, and um, I, I remember when, when I, before Harvard, I taught at uh, the Kellogg School at Northwestern, and we decided to create an executive program on negotiations. And we met with uh, Phil Kotler, who was our colleague and perhaps the world's most famous marketing professor. And he said, who's your audience? And um, we said, everybody. And he said, that's a really bad answer. You know, if, you know I, I can tell you how to market to purchasing agents. I can tell you how to market to investment banking professionals. But everybody is just always a bad answer in marketing. And we kind of persisted, but everybody should learn how to negotiate better. Um, and, um, I, and I think that anybody running an institution that has lots of people should be well-versed on behavioral insights. Um, that it's a sort of a, it's kind of like anybody running an institution should understand basic economic principles. We should also understand what are the departures from basic economics that provide us insights and, and uh, uh, to figure out how to lead more effectively. If you ask me, is there more potential on implementation or policy development, I'd say implementation. We know so much more about sort of how to use behavioral insights in terms of implementation issues, in terms of the functions of government. So I, I think that that's the easy answer. That said, um, I, um, I, I'd be perfectly entertained um, to have discussions about how would you use behavioral insights to create wiser policies. Um, uh, so I, I think that on the policy world, um, we so frequently miss opportunities for what economists would call Pareto efficient improvements, where the right and the left would, can both find a solution that would be better for the environment and for business, but we don't because we're fighting um, uh, sort of a mythical fixed pie of more or less regulation, and we miss opportunities for wiser regulation. So I think that there's uh, certainly potential of using behavioral insights on how do we create wiser public policies, um, but I think that that's a much harder story to implement. Um, so there's easy pickings available, and uh, the UK what, what's work, what, what Works project does a good job of telling us where a lot of the easy pickings are. Um, I would start with, with that, and then hope, hopefully the people who are developing policy would, will come along and say, um, us too. And I think that we can use behavioral insights to come up with wiser policies as well. Um, uh, let me just uh, thank all of you for your terrific questions, for, for being here. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to have an opportunity to speak to you.
Okay, and I was about to say thank you very much to, uh, to Max Bazeman for, uh, for actually running over and having so much to say. I thought that was a very good point and positive point to end on, maybe provoke a bit of discussion outside. And thank you all, and as I said before, thank you all for being so flexible and accommodating and making the not very long walk from Carlton Gardens to Carlton House Terrace. Thank you very much to the Royal Academy for Engineering for hosting us uh, at such short notice here today. And hopefully the next time you come to the Institute for Government, you really will be able to get into the Institute for Government. So thank you all very much, and thank you to Professor Baseman. Thank you. Thank you.